So even though we have really, really large revenue um, coming from, from broadcast, from ticket sales, licensing, we also have kind of higher costs in, in college athletics, right? So, you know, if we believe that one way to improve kind of my quality is to spend more money on my program, it gets a little weird here, right? Because I think with professional sports, the way we talk about this, yes, we can go out and get better facilities and better coaches, but primarily where they spend their money is on player salaries, right? Trying to obtain the highest quality players by offering them the highest contract, right? Well, we can't do that in college athletics, right? Well, I can't do that directly with a salary, right? But what can I, what could I do instead of paying a student athlete with money, you know, here's a, you know, million dollar a year stipend, right? I can't do that. But what I can do is what? How can I, and, and think about it as, you know, I can give them a scholarship, but on top of that, what's the way I can increase not the amount of money I'm giving them, but maybe increase that student athlete's utility? So better chance to go to go pro is good. So what is one way I can increase the quality of my program without spending money on my my athletes? Yeah, we look at college coaches' salaries; they're just as comparable to professional coach. I mean, they they're paid astronomical amounts of money that are comparable to a lot of the coaching. Honestly, some of them probably more than some of the coaches make in in, in the professional level, right? So these colleges spend money where they can, right, on coaches. What else can maybe you do to attract a, an athlete? Yeah, you got, we could probably Google it. I think it's uh, Oregon's um, like locker room. I mean, they're, they just look wild, right? They're spending so much money on their facilities, locker rooms, weight rooms, um, even their stadiums, right? To attract these players, right? Increasing their utility by all these other amenities, okay? So what we see though is that we end up with this prison, no, it's not necessarily a prisoner's dilemma, sorry. We end up with this equilibrium where I need to outspend it. That's great. If I get a better coach, I provide better facilities, I can attract a higher quality player only if the other schools don't do that as well, right? So there's an incentive for every single school to be the one that, you know, I don't know, puts a swimming pool in the, the middle of the locker room, you know, so, something wild to like really attract the, the athlete. So we kind of have this arms race where every top level program is just trying to outspend every other top level program on facilities, coaches, anything that they can other than athlete salaries, right? Because they're, they're not allowed to do that at this point. So um, if we look at kind of the budgets of these, the, uh, these athletic departments, 14% of their expenses are kind of on, on scholarships, right? So this isn't just football and basketball, right? If we think about the entire athletic department, well, we've got, you know, every single sport, right, that that college has and the scholarships that are given for each one of those sports, that's going to add up pretty quickly, right? Excuse me. So one thing about this expense, though, is if I'm giving them a scholarship, what's the actual cost to the university? I mean, it's, it's a little bit tricky, right? Because... If I allow a student athlete to come to my university for free, right, the only way in which that really costs me any money in terms of, um, you, know, you know, one additional student isn't gonna you know, necessarily increase, uh, you know, the, 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 you know uh, we think about things like the buildings and the, that's our all fixed costs, right? So it's not gonna be kind of tied to the number of students there. However, if, I've limited my enrollment. So it doesn't apply to, I think, when we think about these large universities, like even like Ball State and these kind of big one, big D1 programs. But even if we look outside of D1 and some of these smaller schools that cap their enrollment, if I give a college scholarship, a free ride to a student athlete, but I said I'm only gonna accept a thousand students this year, at a small liberal arts college or something. Well, I've just displaced a non-student athlete who would have paid tuition. So it's really like an opportunity cost, right? Now that only occurs if I have a fixed enrollment, right? Because when I have a fixed enrollment, 
having that student athlete would displace a non-student athlete. Okay? So, um, oh, we're, I think I have that down here. Right here we go. And we'll come back to this point in a second. So, what's that actual cost? Well, if they wouldn't have attended unless I gave that to them, right? As well. So, you know, if if giving that student athlete the scholarship made them come to my my school, well, then if I didn't give them that scholarship. That would have gotten tuition from them anyways. So there, it's like a zero cost, right? Because if I didn't give them this scholarship, right, I wouldn't have been getting any tuition from them anyways. Now, if they would have attended, even without the scholarship, well, now, now there is an opportunity cost there, right? I'm losing out on that tuition that I would have got from that student. Or this idea of if they would have displaced another student, if I had fixed enrollment, well, now my opportunity cost is the tuition that I would have been making from this other student. Um, and here I'm just kind of mentioning, I think I've already said this, but the idea would be that, uh, you know, the wage I can pay, right, I can't give them a million dollars, but I can give them this scholarship. And so my wage is kind of fixed, right? It's kind of set at whatever my tuition would be. So what do schools do? We've already mentioned this as well, not just on uh, facilities, but they'll, they'll spend money on facilities, recruiting trips all these other things to try to increase the utility of the student athlete in ways of, which is, you know, not just from directly giving them money, right? Um, you know, so if we look at kind of the expense reports of a lot of these universities, it's gonna be a lot higher than what operating expenses are because, you know, if I put the value of the scholarship down as an expense, but it didn't displace another student and the student you know, wouldn't have attended my university unless I gave them the scholarship, well, really there was no, no cost, right? And so if I'm building that into my expenses, but that's not gonna be reflected in my operating expenses, I'll see that my, my expenses or average expenses are a lot larger than that uh, operating expense. Okay. Um, and, you know, <laughs> all this to, said, you know, to, to be said, you know, someone could have stopped me at any point and said, okay, well, yeah, you're not allowed to pay them money but for sure there are plenty of examples where that has occurred, right? So you can resort to almost like a black market where you illegally kind of pay these players, right? Or maybe not them, but their, their families or set their families up with a house or something like that, right? So, and you know, the, the, reason, you know, the reason here is why would they resort to this? Well, you know, there's always gonna be an incentive to be that one school that does that, right? Because then you can attract the higher quality players, generate a higher quality team, generate more revenue, could follow this all the way down the line. So if we come go back to uh, when I was talking about what percent of schools are profitable, right? So we broke it down by basketball and football. If I look at all the kind of uh, um, BCS schools, 72% of the, the programs, the entire department is profitable. Okay? So this falls to 30%, or sorry, I said this backwards. 72% of schools show some profit, right? If I look at the athletic department um, and I take away the revenue they generate, that would fall to 30%, right? So these athletic departments are really kind of keeping afloat a lot of these, you know, are really generating a lot of the, the money at these universities, right? So other revenue that comes in uh, to these athletic departments is through things like student fees and subsidies, right? So, you know, these, these, uh, athletic, or, um, these athletic programs like football, basketball, cross country, whatever, even though they're not turning a profit, on the books it might look like they are, right? Because what the university does is it charges students fees and then takes that money to help subsidize, right, those athletic programs. So if I look at, um, oh, what's a good school to pick on here? If I were to look at uh, Indiana State, I believe they have a football program. I think, I know they do actually. Um, I mean, it's not a profitable program, right? Their expenses are higher than their, they're not generating hardly any revenue. So the university will charge student fees or just outright take money from other areas of the university and subsidize that program. Now, why do they do that? That's kind of, a, you know, we go into, I think I might uh, save that for a different day, but the idea there is, you know, somehow having this program 
is bringing students who otherwise wouldn't have been here is, is the main kind of synopsis of that. So if we don't include scholarships, um, it actually looks like a lot more of these athletic departments are profitable. And that's because really that, like we said, a lot of those scholarships are really a zero cost. If the student wouldn't have went there otherwise and we're not displacing a student, then really we shouldn't have been putting those on the books anyways, right? Um, so these student fees, I've already kind of mentioned a little bit. So if we think about, and I, I kind of already alluded to this, but what schools do you think we would require larger student fees? Well, probably programs that aren't generating as much revenue, lower, lower quality conferences, um, you know, not the, the typical teams we think about when we think about big college sports, right? So it's gonna be these schools that can't generate enough revenue to kind of support their athletic department. And really what this ultimately boils down to is whether or not you have a successful football, men's football, men's basketball program. Because the, the, the revenue generated from those relative to the other sports, it's just not comparable, right? So smaller, I already mentioned smaller conferences, um, you know, Florida International has 70% of their total revenue coming from student fees. So, you know, they would not be breaking even if they didn't have those fees. Uh, I looked at Ball State just out of curiosity. And uh, for the, this is not for one specific sport, but for the athletic department, 50% of their revenue comes from student fees, right? So really the athletic department here is, is really supported by you. Right there, there you, you, you don't see it directly come out of your tuition, but it's part of it. Um, and then I think the, the school that had the highest just dollar amount was $28 million in student fees was Old Dominion. So what percent of these major conferences schools do you think probably comes from student fees? My kind of guess it's a lot lower than 70 and 50%, right? In fact, 26 of them, if we look at those power five, 26 of the schools in those conferences absolutely zero dollars from student fees, right? So, you know, it's kind of, I, I'm gonna go on a little bit of an aside here, but this is an interesting thought in that the schools we think of where they have large football, men's football, men's basketball programs and have a really large following, they probably have the students who would be the most willing to pay for those programs, right? They're gonna be getting a, a higher utility amount from these high quality teams. And the irony is that they're actually paying $0 in student fees. My guess is if the University of Texas wanted to, to if, I don't know if they don't have a fee, let's assume that they don't. But if they wanted to say to every student and give every student the decision, look, we can have no athletic department or if you pay, I don't know, $50 a semester, will have what we currently have. I would think most of the students I like, go there, a lot of them would, would support that. I mean, not everyone, right? They would probably have the most students who would be willing to support that. However, they don't need to, right? Um, and then when you have your smaller universities where the utility gain from kind of these sports programs isn't very high, hell, I mean, I don't know. I, bet, I would imagine a lot of Indiana State students don't ever go to a football game or even are aware they have a football team, they're actually the schools that are charging the highest student fees. Um, so I don't know. I, I always find that kind of like a good little kind of irony in that. Um, you know, other subsidies, it, it's, it's not really that interesting to talk about. There's a trade-off, I guess, between these other subsidies and student fees, right? I can, uh, you know, take some money uh, that I would have otherwise spent on, I don't know, the uh, um, landscaping of my university, right? Maybe not plant as many flowers and give some of that money to, to the athletic department. Uh, or I could just, de you know, I could uh, decrease the amount that student tuition is going towards landscaping and just make that a fee and give it to the, the athletic department, right? So it's really just kind of a trade-off, kind of shifting money around there. Um, kind of a good example of this is, you know, Old Dominion, I said, had the highest student fees. They don't have any subsidies coming from like any other area of the university. Um, what am I saying here? No student. Oh, some of these schools kind of break this trade off though. They're, it's you know, these large programs. Some of them just say, look, if, if we can't have a self-sustained athletic department, we don't want one. And they actually commit to no student fees and no subsidies, right? And actually, we'll take a look here. 
I think I have one more. I'm not going to waste time on it. Well, well, let's look at the data and I'll come back to this. So here I, I have this subsidy data and I put this up on Canvas. I, I broke it down there. You got 2010, 2015, but let's just look at 2015 here. Um, I've got it all filtered already. So I added that filter to it. So let's look and see. Oh, I want to blow this up for you guys. So just as a reminder to set those filters to make the data a little bit easier, I go to the very first cell, control shift or command shift on a Mac, over arrow, down arrow, and let's select my entire data set. The filter option here is already turned on. I'll turn it off, turn it back on just to kind of show you. Now we get these little arrows for every variable. So here I could look at what athletic, well, I don't want the changes. I want just uh, the raw numbers. So here we go. Who had the highest ticket sales for other athletic departments? So this is the entire athletic department. So we'll go largest to smallest. I want to see the names. All right, so we got Texas, Ohio State, Michigan, right? You can kind of kind of sort the data by that. We could also look at who has the kind of smallest subsidy, right? Who has zero subsidies? So we would expect, okay, come on, this is going to be annoying. Let me see if I can get this all in the same. There we go. So the schools that have zero subsidies here are kind of these are pretty large programs, right? Probably athletic departments that don't need to kind of take money from, from other areas to support their athletic department. Although, uh, you know, being an alum, Purdue kind of surprises me here. <laughs> maybe, maybe they should start to have some, some subsidies for their program. But, um, but, you know, we've got some, you know, other large programs, kind of low subsidy amount. Let's actually look at who has the highest. What we would expect to be is kind of these larger, not larger, sorry, smaller conference schools. Sure enough, the Air Force, Old Dominion, uh, UMass, Connecticut, Eastern Michigan, right? Houston's a little bit surprising that they're taking so much money from, from other areas of the university, but you know, it's kind of interesting to play around with that. that like I said, this data is, is up on Canvas. You can kind of play around with it. Um, We've got student fees right here. So we could see who has no student fees. So all these zeros. Notice there's a lot of schools that have kind of committed to that. But once again, Ohio State, IU, um, South Carolina, a lot, a lot of big programs here. Although Akron's kind of surprising um, and some of these, these smaller schools up here, but maybe they just committed, right? They think that, look, we can't charge any higher tuition. And so we're going to kind of limit the, limit the student fees. So there's, now uh, this is kind of interesting to play around with. You can sort all these different variables. If you really wanted to, if you're interested in um, how to use this filter tool to answer some other in interesting questions, and this could apply to kind of your, your data um, for your project. Well, notice what I could do is go to this conference variable. So it's not just a sorter, right? It's a filter, right? So I can, Deselect all these, and then I'm going to go to the MAC, the Mid American Conference. Hit OK. Now I'm only going to see schools that are in the MAC. And then from there, I could say, OK, who's generating the most total revenue in the MAC? So I'm going to go largest to smallest. Looks like Western, Western Michigan, right? Well, at least we're not last, right? So, um, <laughs> but, uh, you know, you can also look at even though we're next to last, let's go largest to smallest here. Who's, who's charging the highest student fees, right? And we can kind of see here, well, we're in the middle of the pack, right? So you can play around with this and like look within conference, or even if I, you know, I think in the original data over here, I had it 2010, 2015 were the two years I had. So what I originally did was just filter the data to only see 2015 and then copy and put that on a different worksheet just so it was a little bit easier to work with. But that filter tool is pretty useful when I'm trying to like break the data up by a specific variable and I'm trying to look for like minimum, maximums, um, you know, just kind of kind of more examples of uh, in Excel, I want to kind of play around with the data here a little bit. Um, is there anything else I wanted to say with this? Any other, any questions from me or kind of anything with this data or how you would kind of work with your own data set with this filter option or kind of the limitations or how much it can actually do? Okay. All right. Uh, all right. I'll go 
back here. So um, in a different file, I think I had some, some donations and contributions uh, data as well. But, you know, average contribution is $12 million a year to these athletic departments. There's a lot of variation. You know, we got schools like Florida International making almost no money. And when we have schools like a and I mean, I don't know. <laughs> this was uh, so this was a 2015. I don't know who it was. I forget now because my memory is not the best. But there was, uh, you know, some multimillionaire or billionaire who gave a bunch of money to A&M in 2015. So this is a little bit of an anomaly um, that they're that high. But you can kind of see, I mean, there's, there's some pretty large amounts of money being given back to these athletic departments every year. Okay. So, I don't know. This is kind of fun stuff to talk about, kind of just thinking about the amount of money that, that is generating, some of the economic issues that revolve around, um, you know, these conferences receiving money and competitive balance. But we can also think about, they all have the NCAA looking out as a kind of a regulatory agency. So the NCAA does want what's best for kind of the NCAA product. Right? So they, they have rules and, and we'll start to go through a few of them. So college sports started out to really control these, these student athletes. Um, and ideally, you know, the NCAA, well, they can say whatever they want, but the incentives for them would be that they really want to prevent professional athletes from kind of moving on, right, or going to a professional level. Because if they stay and play sports in college, right, that's generating revenue for them, whereas if they go professional, they're losing out on all that revenue, right? So, um, you know, they started kind of, you know, they can they maybe started to prevent originally from these schools to pay individuals to come play for them, right? So, uh, you know, before they had done this, there were people who like literally would, would go play college sports and that was the, kind of their career. They were like a, basically, you know, like a minor league baseball player or something. Um, they didn't deal with it themselves because, you know, every individual college had an incentive to be the one that, that paid for the, the highest quality player. And so we end up eventually with the NCAA and the way that they actually act is kind of like a, a monopoly, right? So it's truly a cartel because each school is an individual kind of, you can think of as company, but they've all agreed that they're going to follow the rules of this one unifying agency, which is the NCAA. So cartel is the idea that, you know, everybody within the cartel is behaving in a way that benefits the, the entirety of the group, right? And if we all act in that way, we can, we can have monopoly power. Okay. So cartels usually, we think of, uh, you know, they're organizing some type of output decision. If you've had economic courses, usually a cartel you're thinking about, they set quantity, right? Um, you know, so that's usually how we think about it. So it allows them, once they set quantity, that results in a certain price people are willing to pay. And, and, and generally they set the quantity at whatever a monopoly would. And so they generate higher profits than if they were to kind of compete or be perfectly competitive with each other. Um, and one thing that I don't think this usually gets brought up in a lot of uh, like 201 or kind of your, your other undergraduate econ courses you might have had at this point is a cartel you can see that exist where they have monopoly power over whatever the product is, right? But a lot of times that's also going to give them monopsony power in the labor market, okay? So here, right, for NCAA, right, if every team is, is acting in accordance with the NCAA rules and regulations and, and kind of the um, following their output decisions, that also gives them power over the labor market and, monop sorry, monopsony power over the labor market. So if we think about what is the output in NCAA football or these different programs, it's really going to be the number of games that are played, right? The NCAA is going to choose that. Um, it's going to choose the number of games that can, you know, that it wants to put on in these, these playoffs, right? Playoffs or these, the tournament. Um, and so really what it's going to do is the NCAA looks at every single university, aggregates their marginal cost curve, right? Looks at the marginal revenue, Kind of based off the overall demand for that college sport and then tries to just to, to set you know the number of games at whatever that optimal amount is okay so um you know i think i have 
just kind of a nice visual here. I'm going to go ahead and draw this. I'll probably pick up in this next class and, and go through some more examples of this. But I just want to introduce it today with kind of this traditional kind of textbook drawing. So you think about if we only had two teams, right, and they each had their own marginal cost curve. What the NCAA is going to do or what the cartel here is going to do is, well, look at every kind of quantity in this range, this second team, team B, isn't willing to supply any games, right? Okay. So the only way that the kind of overall marginal cost curve is going to change is if we can get up to this quantity here where team B will start to kind of supply some games. Right? Then from that point on, my marginal cost curve is just the sum of both these schools' marginal cost curves. So, you know, if I had this set up and I allowed teams to make decisions individually, right, well, they're not going to face this demand curve. They're going to face a half of, you know, at most half of demand, right? So this demand is going to be quite a bit lower. They're going to, you know, we choose a lower kind of quantity. However, if they can act as one, right, and they face, you know, the overall demand for that sport, right, we can kind of see that we'll get this quantity it's, it's quite a bit higher than if we allowed either one of them to kind of choose it on their own. Um, like I said, I'll review this in more detail in kind of, kind of next class, but I want to introduce the idea here. One thing I also want to mention here is, you know, we have two teams. The NCAA is looking at a lot more than two here. <laughs> um, so this becomes, a, you know, I'm saying this is always very easy to figure out what this kind of aggregate marginal cost curve is. It's not. Right? Um, but this is like where we would start with two teams.